I'm Steve Brown from the band Trickster. Yeah, um, Trickster. Trickster was a band I started uh, when I was 12 years old, back in 1983, in the heyday of the hard rock, heavy metal scene. We were, you know, influenced by, you know, all the greats, Van Halen, Def Leppard, Bon Jovi, um, Motley, everything. And we were little kids, though, so um, the effect of the band was just immediate. All those bands that we loved was just so... Uh, thrilling for us and I think you know bands like Def Leppard the younger bands it gave us hope because you know Rick Allen was 16 when On Through the Night came out and they were touring were opening up for ACDC so it was inspiration it's like man we could do this so Def Leppard was definitely a big blueprint for me with Trickster and uh, we just started we started out playing you know playing our local middle school that was our first gig we ever did playing uh, you know and my father was the vice principal there which was really cool so we got paid 50 bucks and, uh, and four little, little uh, milk containers. It's like, all right, so yeah, I'm a professional now, you know, it's pretty cool. But then from there we started writing, you know, I always wrote songs. Even when I, you know, I started playing guitar when I was eight, 1978, and I always wrote songs. But it wasn't until about 1984 that Trickster started incorporating original material into the shows. And, um, 86 was a pivotal time. That was, that was when Bon Jovi's Slippery When Wet came out. And the whole flood, the floodgates opened, let's say, especially for New Jersey bands. So that was a time, and at that time, before Slippery When Wet blew up big, um, we, we had met the Bon Jovi guys, and we actually gave John uh, a demo tape of ours, really rough. But he was so cool that he called us up on our hotline, and he... Um, he, t he told us how much he liked it. He said, you guys got a lot of potential, keep it up. And it was like, man, we were like, holy shit, we're gonna get signed, you know, John's gonna sign us. It's gonna be crazy. Of course, that didn't happen. But it was still inspiration, another thing. And we were like, you know, again, we can do this. And at, we started playing in New Jersey. There was this little scene going on, um, kind of like out here in Hollywood, all ages nights. You know, I was 15 years old playing bars in, you know, New Jersey, Staten Island, uh, Brooklyn, Lemoore, famous Lemoore in Brooklyn. And it was a really cool time because there was a lot of bands and everybody sort of had that same energy going on from the whole New Jersey thing and Bon Jovi. And then after that, we met John. He introduced us to the Skid Row guys. And again, that was another thing. So we used to open for Skid Row a lot back in the day, even before Sebastian was in the band when they had the original singer, Matt Fallon. And uh, it was just a really cool time. And, you know, like a lot of bands, we became in this area, uh, in the tri-state area, Bergen County, especially in New Jersey, where we're from, we became like the biggest band in the area. And probably in 1987, if I remember correctly, is when I met um, this guy, Ken Mako, who became our manager. And he came out to this club out in Staten Island, New York, to see us. and. Um, he was like, you know, I love you guys, you have something really unique. And, uh, you know, we were really rough back then, but we had a cool thing. You know, I was doing like a whole Eddie Van Halen, mini Eddie Van Halen thing. And, um, and then from there, we found out that our, our friend, you know, soon-to-be manager, Ken Mako, was good friends with Peter Mensch from Q Prime Management who was Def Leppard's manager, Def Leppard, Metallica, the big, you know, every big band, Tesla. So right from there, we were like, wow, we got something really cool going on here with, uh, with this guy, Ken. They, he signed on to be our manager and he had a partner who was a money guy. And one thing led to another, man, and we just started doing showcases, you know, playing uh, the Cat Club in New York City and the Limelight and, you know, the Def Leppard guys would come to our gigs and we would go hang out with them when they were on the Hysteria tour. So it was like a really incredible time, you know, and, and impressionable for us, you know, to see how the big guys do it. And, um, and the really cool thing that really started getting the ball rolling for Trickster in 88 was Peter Mensch would go around with our demo tape and he'd say he'd put him you know go to all his record company buddies and he'd go this band's gonna open up for Def Leppard on the next tour 
So that opened up the, you know, the whole thing as far as you know, the A&R guys, everybody under the sun coming to see us play. You know, it was really cool is we had a lot of A&R guys would come to my mom and dad's house in Paramus, New Jersey, where we rehearsed in the basement. And they would come to the house and, uh, and watch us practice and like have lunch with us and like just shoot the shit because, you know, like I said, we were young. You know, at that point, I was, I think, I was 17. PJ, my bass player, he was 15. Gus, our drummer, was 19, and Pete was like 21. Our singer was the oldest guy in the band. So it was a cool thing, you know, and, and they, would, they would see, you know, come to my mom and dad's house and sit down with us and, you know, have a beer or whatever or have soda and just shoot the shit. And it was really cool. And you know, a lot of, you know, Geffen Records, I remember uh, Michael Rosenblatt, his dad was the president. He was, he was real hot on signing us. But, um, it took a little while. We were doing a bunch of showcases, and we were, I remember driving in the car with my bass player, PJ, going, dude, this is, this is really easy. You know, like, wow, we're going to get a deal soon. We had Mercury wanting to sign us. We had Geffen. And then, three months later, we still didn't have a deal. And I'm like, wow, this is weird. And then it just got, you know, word got back to us that a lot of these labels were kind of gun shy because we were so young, and we weren't, like, as polished as some of the other bands. Yeah, so we're, we're going about three months after all these labels are seeing us. We had um, Chrysalis Records, everybody, all the big labels, and we still didn't have a deal. And it, you know, like I was saying, it got back to us that you know, a lot of labels felt we weren't ready yet. And we weren't, you know, but a good producer could have taken care of that. You know? And we had a unique thing because we were definitely, out of all the bands on the scene, we were the young band, you know, like kind of the new kids on the block of rock who was like you know, what people were calling us and stuff, which was cool to me because new kids were selling out football stadiums. So, um, but luckily, you know, about nine months after the whole, you know, the ball started getting rolling for us, we had this guy, Steve Sinclair, at um, Mechanic MCA Records, and they had Bang Tango at the time, Dream Theater, Voivod, and uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't the dream deal, you know, for me, I wanted to be on Mercury, I wanted to be on Warner Brothers, but this guy had such a unique view of us, and just something I said to the guys, I said, this guy is the guy, he gets it you know, out of the box things and, you know, and, and between our management and this guy, Mechanic MCA Records, Steve Sinclair, they saw something unique in Trickster that, you know, we weren't like, we weren't like your typical hair band. We weren't wearing the, you know, the spandex. We were wearing like jeans and rock shirts and, you know, flannels. It was a different look. And they capitalized on that. And we didn't even know it, like how important that was to get, you know, that, that gave us that unique identity. And there's nothing wrong with all those bands. You know, I loved Warrant, I loved Poison, you know, Motley, everybody wearing the big clothes and the shiny and the sequins and the, you know, who was the one clothing designer that designed all the clothes for everybody. We didn't have that. We didn't have the budget for that. But um, so yeah, we finally got signed in, um, I believe it was May of 89. Um, and uh, I remember we went into, into the MCA offices and took a picture at the, I'm walking in for the first time, like, you know, seeing all these gold and platinum albums on the wall, like, oh my God, this is crazy. And we took a picture for Billboard magazine with Al Teller, who was the president of MCA at the time. And, uh, you know, it was a really cool thing. And then in September of 89 was uh, when we got shipped out to uh, Hollywood, California to record our first album. A magical time and as you guys know 1989 out here was you know we came out in September of 89 and we had three weeks before we had to start recording so it was just like party time for us we went to I remember the foundations forum we saw Soundgarden I remember seeing Soundgarden play before they blew up which is funny um, Alice Cooper and Dave Mustaine did this goofy thing and and just being around all real rock stars for the first time we're like holy shit you know we met the Def Leppard guys Metallica but this was hanging in LA you know it was like you know it was really important for us and you know really mind-blowing at the same time our first time being away from our parents and families and stuff and uh, and we had we had a damn good time I'll tell you that you know we lived it up I think it was what was it Thursday nights they used to do what at Bordello was that the big Thursday night hang 
And for us, Van Halen was the reason that Trickster started, you know, that that was the band that we kind of modeled ourselves after, you know, like a mini version of. And uh, I'll never forget being in there and like my drummer came over to me and goes, dude, David Lee Roth is over there. And I look and Dave's there and he's, he's on his motorcycle. So he's got black leather and like, and we're like, holy shit, like seeing God, you know, like David fucking Lee Roth is here. And we were like, we gotta go talk to him. And we're all like figuring out how we're gonna do it. I go, fuck you guys. I'm going to talk to Roth right now. So I went up and talked to him. And he was really cool. He was like drinking a beer and just, you know, talking to his buddies. And he, he, he talked to me and I told him, hey man, we just got a record deal. And, you know, I don't really remember. He went into like a Zabaduba, you know, typical David Lee Roth thing. But I remember just going like, holy shit, this is fucking, this is crazy. And he's like, you know, I just remember when I shook his hand, he said, good luck. And that was like, you know, that was the first, for me, that was like meeting, you know, meeting the Pope or meeting God because, you know, I hadn't met Eddie yet, which was, that comes, you know, a couple of years later. We recorded at Sound City. We started rehearsing over there and then recording there. And uh, it was really cool because Sound City, you know, amazing studio. I don't know if you guys have worked there, but, you know, the history. So for us to walk in there, you know, see the D.O. Platinum album on the wall and, you know, and, and really cool thing, we walk in the studio to start recording and y and recording in the next studio. And we were like, holy shit, this is crazy. And then, you know, every day someone else would be, you know, coming in. The Scorpions were recording next door at Goodnight L.A. with um, Keith Olsen. You know, so it was like crazy. For us, you know, as I, as I said, we were little kids. I was, you know, 17 years old, 18, you know, like complete mind-blowing stuff, but we were just loving it. I think one of the greatest memories and that I'm thankful for is, is that we got to do the big label, you know, big budget records in big recording studios, you know, in New York, the same thing. You know, Trickster Record comes out September of 1990, October of 1990, Give It To Me Good, our first single gets added to MTV. Within a week, it was number one on MTV. It was number one for, I think, eight weeks. I could be wrong, I, I'll get the stats, but, and you know, our lives changed completely. We were, we were on tour, I'll never forget it, we were on tour opening up for Don Dockin, Solo, or it might have been Striper. And we went from being sort of, we were the opening act, but we were really the headliner. And you saw immediately how fast the power of MTV. And then, you know, our next single came out, One in a Million, went to number one for 12 weeks. We were on tour opening up for the Scorpions, playing multiple nights out here. You know, we did two nights at Irvine Meadows, two nights at the, uh, uh, the um, Oakland Coliseum. It's mind blowing, crazy stuff. And then, the, the pivotal moment where, which I think what you guys are getting at, and this is a gr really cool story, our old radio guy, this guy Bill Bennett at MCA Records, he was, the, he was the radio guy. He became the head radio guy at Geffen Records. Now, this was the end of our touring cycle. October of 91, we were on tour with Warrant and Firehouse, the Blood, Sweat and Beers tour, amazing. Played the uh, Universal Amphitheater, and we had a couple days off. We were staying at the Riot House, and so, we, uh, we, we were good friends with Bill still. We go, Bill, hey man, what are you doing? He goes, yeah, come over to the office. Come over to the Geffen office on Sunset. We go up there and we go, hey man, what's happening? He goes, hey man, I want you to hear this new band that's starting to blow up. It was Nirvana. And he plays it for us. And I'm like, man, that's like Cheap Trick meets Black Sabbath. I'm like, I dig it, it's cool. You know, and he gave us the swag bag, the original Nirvana t-shirt with the smiley face and not thinking anything of it, that that was gonna be the band that completely wiped out everything. 